In this video, I'm going to show you the most exciting game of the London Chess Classic so far. We have already briefly looked at uh, Hans Niemann, his first round game, which was not a uh, very exciting game, ended in a draw, as well as his other two games he played. So Hans is having one and a half out of three, nothing too spectacular yet after his amazing performance of eight out of nine in the uh, Zagreb uh, Tournament of Peace. So Hans is playing in a quiet way so far, but all eyes are on Gukesh. The young Indian top player is uh, in great shape. He's um, having two and a half out of three and especially his third round game in this tournament. Ooh la la, that was just amazing. Let's have a look. He's playing with the white pieces against uh, Andrei Folokitin, a very uh, strong grandmaster from uh, Ukraine. It's going to be a very instructive game. So let's go straight into the action. 1c4, knight f6, knight c3, c5. It's the symmetrical English uh, variation, usually a very solid way of uh, playing for black, but the game can explode anytime. White goes g3, d5, pawn takes d5, knight takes d5, and the bishop comes to g2 to attack the knight. So black has to make a choice here. What are you going to do with your knight? You can take on c3, but that gives white the opportunity to capture towards the center. And these pawns, they're usually quite nice together with this fianchetto bishop. I think white can count on a small, uh, small plus here. So therefore the main continuation instead is to drop back with a knight to c7. So the knight is uh, solidly placed uh, there. Now by far the main move is just to continue with the move knight f3, uh, completing your king's side development. But Gukesh has a different idea in mind as he is opting for a so-called double fianchetto. He played the move b3 and after e5 he places the other bishop on, uh, on the long diagonal. So white is uh, interestingly enough keeping its central pawns on their initial squares so that they will not hinder the bishops uh, contesting the uh, crucial squares along these uh, diagonals. Bishop e7 and the rook comes in to c1. Now black played a very illogical move, castling kingside, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but in hindsight maybe it's just safer to overprotect your pawn on e5 with the move f6 so that this pawn can never really be attacked by the bishop on uh, b2 and later on it will be harder for white to activate that uh, that piece on uh, b2. So let's go back to the game. Instead there followed castling kingside and now Gukesh comes up with a novelty. New move, knight e4, which is in fact a double attack because the knight together with the rook is attacking the pawn on c5 while the bishop hits the pawn on e5. So white is about to win a pawn here. The move b6 is uh, played, which looks very shaky. Uh, there are possible ideas, probably for white, to look for a discovered attack against the rook. But the good news for black is that this knight on c7 still protects the rook. So it's not really easy for white to win material, in fact. But you can take the pawn on e5, which was played by Gukesh. And even though black has given up this pawn, his position is not too bad at all because bishop b7 is played and black is about to complete development whereas white is consuming a lot of time with his minor pieces in the center um, and that has the drawback that the king side development has been uh, delayed here. So what should, um, what should uh, white do here? Well, first of all, with the bishop on b7, you're putting pressure against the bishop on g2 indirectly. So... Um, First, the move bishop a1 was played. That's a clever move to make sure that the bishop is not hanging because black cannot really play the move f5 here. It's the move you would like to play because if the knight goes away, the bishop on g2 would be taken. If you give a check on uh, f6, there is bishop takes f6. And now after bishop takes b7, well, the problem for black is that this bishop on a1 is just protected. So white wins uh, material. Therefore, f5 is not possible yet, but it explains the next couple of moves. Black, instead of playing f5, went here for this move. Queen c8 may look strange, but you're protecting the bishop on b7. So now, if white plays a call move like d3, f5 would follow. And the knight cannot really go away because after that, the bishop on g2 would be taken. So white got to come up with an antidote for this uh, pressure against the knight or the unprotected uh, bishop on g2. One idea here is to play the move king f1, so that if the knight comes under threat, at least the knight can go away and the king protects the, uh, the bishop. That's all right. But Gukesh 
has a very spectacular idea in mind, as instead, he goes for the move g4, and this may come as a huge surprise. It looks like a very weakening move in, in front of um, uh, black's uh, white's pieces on the, on the king's side, but the point is that the pawn cannot really be taken. If you do that, there is knight f6 with check, once again, after bishop takes f6, bishop takes b7 can be played, and on the next move, the rook on a8 can just be taken. So, the pawn on g4 is poisoned. What should black do instead? Well, a move like knight c6 may just give black some uh, reasonable compensation. He should try to complete its development uh, quickly, bring the queen into play, as well as centralize the rooks. There is definitely some play, because white still needs a couple of moves to bring its king into safety. Well, this was not played, as after the move g4, Falokitin played here knight e6. Seems very natural, because the knight is intending to come into f4. That's the drawback of having played the move g3 to g4, because the pawn no longer covers that square. However, with this move knight a3, black cannot really go there any longer, because the knight covers that square on f4. Now, after knight c6, black brings its remaining piece into the game. White can even castle kingside here, but it's understandable that you would like to start here with this move, e3. Because now the pawn on g4 is even better protected by the queen, and also the pawn covers the d4 square, so none of these knights can come into the d4 square. One drawback, however, of playing this move, e3, is the move bishop a6, when white's king is still kind of stuck in the center and black has even ideas to play knight b4, knight coming into d3. It's a very unclear position and uh, I think black should have gone for this, uh, this option, but instead they followed the move knight b4 right away. So the knight is aiming for the d3 square, which is uh, knight fork winning the exchange. You're even attacking the pawn on a2, but that pawn on a2, that's not an important one at all. White just castled kingside here. That's a good move. Giving up the pawn on a2 for free. There is knight takes c1 as a threat. So the rook goes away to, uh, to b1. And here, that knight on a2 is stranded. And therefore, black decided to go back with the knight immediately to b4. However, here again, it's very important to play with all your pieces. And black's Pieces there are still kind of passive. I mean, the, the major pieces, they are not doing anything. You should try something like queen d7, followed by a rook a d8. And I, I like white's position um, for sure. I, I feel that white's pieces are working better together, but anything can still happen. Let's go back to the game. There didn't uh, follow uh, queen d7, but instead the knight went back to b4. So that were a lot of knight moves in a row. And white, look what Gukesh is doing now. He played here this move, f4. So he's advancing all its pawns in front of the king. That's very sharp way of uh, playing. And the main point is to activate that rook on f1. And you keep your pawns on d2 and e3 so that black is not getting in touch with them. Very original approach. And in a way, it reminds you probably of a video I've covered some days ago. It was this game of Magnus Carlsen starting with this move 1b4. Uh, his basic, basic strategy idea was to put a bishop on this long diagonal and launch the g-pawn. Okay, there are a lot of differences, but you can also draw the similarities. Make sure to watch that game and of course subscribe to the channel if you haven't done yet. After the move f4, there followed f6. So black wants to reduce the mobility of this bishop on uh, a1 and white just calmly played here the move queen f3 i'm not a fan of that move i will explain to you why the queen i think is not doing too well uh, standing in the diagonal of this uh, bishop and instead a much better move would have been here to play the move f5 you're attacking the knight on e6 let me show you one line to illustrate my point if you go knight g5 White is going to take on g5, and after f takes g5, now the main point is to play here the move f6. So you're opening up black's king. You're taking the bishop and the pawn. If you take with the pawn, there will follow the move rook to f5. And there are so many attacking ideas. The queen can still come to f3, the other rook can come to f1. There is massive pressure against the pawn on f6, and very soon black's king will just be opened. The difference with the game is that after the move queen f3, bishop c6 was played so that the bishop is nicely protected now. There are no discovered check 
ideas of knight takes f6 opening up the diagonal so that white can take the bishop the bishop is now very well defended by both the knight and the queen white played here the move f5 and here the critical moment of the game i would say because black may just have played here this move knight to g5 going away with the knight to block further expansion by white the point is after knight takes g5 f takes g5 okay white can move the queen away but if you play in the same way as we have discussed earlier if you play a move like f6 after bishop takes f6 this knight cannot really take because it opens up the diagonal and the queen will come under threat after bishop takes f6 queen e6 beautiful idea everything is hanging the bishop from f6 cannot go away because that hangs the queen everything is pinned so black is now pieced down but on the next move he will regain all the material and he's in good shape back to the game instead of putting the knight on g5 black went for this move knight c7 but i feel that black's pieces are now too far away from where the action is taking place there followed this move g5 with the idea to open up the diagonal remove that annoying pawn from f6 pawn takes g5 and now the queen comes to g3 very simple strategy as now three pieces are targeting this pawn on g5 if the pawn is gone then the queen together with the bishop will threaten checkmate on g7 that's the idea black played here this move h6 trying to hold on to that pawn but now f6 opening up the king side g takes f6 bishop takes f6 so beautiful tactical ideas here for instance there are various captures in the game there followed bishop takes e4 but how about a move like bishop takes f6 well then you gotta take with the knight the knight cannot be taken it's well supported by the rook if the king goes into the corner then knight takes g5 is there with the point that after pawn takes queen takes g5 and there's not much black can do against the mating threat of queen h6 here you see how quickly white pieces are able to attack the black king back to the game after bishop takes f6 black didn't take the bishop but decided to take first the knight on e4 what is happening here if you take on e4 back then black can just take on f6 and that's good news for black but with his bishop on f6 the pawn on g5 is not that well defended any longer and there follow this move knight takes g5 removing the pawn in front of the black king and black's position is falling apart with the main point being that if pawn captures knight its queen takes g5 with check if the king tries to run away it's just check on g7 let's say the king goes to e6 queen takes e7 if the king goes to d5 its bishop takes e4 with checkmate the king cannot go anywhere just checkmate in the middle of the board that's a very convincing line so instead of uh, taking the knight there followed bishop takes f6 but now it's just rook takes f6 you're eliminating another important defender let's have a look rook takes f6 knight takes e4 discover check and the king gotta go somewhere but if the king let's say goes to f7 it's knight takes f6 king takes f6 rook f1 and look at this king is just going to be checkmated very soon with three pieces attacking an exposed king this is just made in a few moves therefore Folokitin decided not to put a king on f7 but went with a king to h8 now it's just knight takes f6 it's time to have a look at what's happening here material is even but black's king is wide open the pieces are on the wrong side of the board the rook is even hanging on a8 if the rook goes away then it's boom queen g6 with a double mating threat of either queen h7 or queen takes pawn with uh, with checkmate so black is completely lost played here one more move queen f5 to attack the rook to attack the knight to prevent the queen from coming to g6 but simple move here is just rook f1 to solve your problems the rook is no longer hanging in fact it's attacking the queen it indirectly also defends the knight on f6 after the queen goes away white has a choice he can take the knight it's unprotected or can even take the rook and the mating attack is still uh, going on so this was the moment Folo Keaton said okay i've seen enough well done mr gukesh and gukesh moves to two and a half out of three which is very important for him he needs to win this tournament to be still in uh, contention for a spot in the um, 
uh, candidates tournament uh, next year. So on two and a half out of three, he's having a fantastic start, but let's see how he's uh, going to play in the next couple of rounds. And of course, he also still needs to play with Hans Niemann. Let's see what's going to happen in the next few days. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I will see you soon again.